everyone. Welcome to Condo Insider, where we discuss all things related to condo living and condo ownership. I'm your host, Krista Stadler, here with Patty Kanuha, the producing branch manager of VIP Mortgage in Kailua Kona. Patty will share her insight and wisdom regarding refinancing and the loan process. Welcome, Patty. Aloha. Thank you. All the way from Kona. All the way. Thank you. Yes, yes. And, and for full disclosure, Patty and I have known each other through the industry for, for several years, at least. Many years. Yes, yes. So, Patty, tell us a little bit about um, yourself, how long you've been in the business, have you been in Kona your whole life, just a little background. Sure. So I, um, well, I moved to Kona in 1979. I was raised in Washington state oh, and uh, came here. Hey, we didn't know that, did we? I know. We mm-hmm. came here um, for a month vacation at 19 years old. And so it's been almost, it's been, it's been, yeah, it's been almost, four, it's 41 years this month. Wow. Life happened to a 19 year old. So Long story yeah. short, 41 years later, husband, three boys and seven grandchildren. I'm still here. Excellent. That sounds like me, but mine's only been 21 years. So mm-hmm. how did you, what led you to the mortgage business? Have you been doing it so, for a long yeah. time? Yes. Um, so I started um, in 1987 in traditional banking. So I started as a teller at Pioneer Federal Savings Bank, which was statewide, um, first chartered bank in the state of Hawaii, started the territory way back then. And I was a um, teller, CSR, senior CSR, operations manager, and then to branch manager. Um, and our location was right on Pilate Road. Um, and then right before my 10th year anniversary, we merged with First Twine Bank. So, but at Pioneer, we didn't do personal loans, credit cards, we did mortgages, we did equity lines, deposits, CDs. Um, so when I merged with First Twine Bank, they made me a branch manager in Waikoloa. So that Waikoloa office at First Twine Bank, that's where my first home was with First Twine Bank. And that was in 1987, no, 97. And so I did that for a couple of years. We did really well there. And then I became, and same thing, mortgages, equity lines were my biggest thing. Uh, I did a lot of training on that with tax returns, et cetera. And then um, they made me a, sales manager for five for five branches from Kona Ka'a to Kona or to Kalakikua actually and didn't like that as much because it took me away from that mortgage part and that's when I realized that was really something that I really liked to do so I was um I think it was in 2001 I left First Wine Bank and worked for a mortgage broker for a year and I loved it what I didn't love was um as a broker, you could go to the closing table and things would always still be coming up, back in that day at least. So um, in 2002, I believe, I joined, that's, I joined Wells Fargo as the first private mortgage banker for the state of Hawaii. And um, I think about three years later, I became the, I made a branch manager and kind of split off. And then I did managing the state. So a total 12 oh years God. there. And at that time, we could underwrite our own loans and we could approve our own loans up to a million. So I was the only one in Kona, and then I built a team on Maui, Kauai, and Oahu. And so, so that's well, kind of where have, I kind of found my element. And just you must have it. been traveling a lot with, and you had small kids at that time, right? And didn't you? Well, um, actually, one was at Kamehameha School. One was uh, my oldest son, who was forty already. So, so oh. he was already into the in the military, and the other one was in high school. So I was. It was a good time, actually. Okay. Um, my youngest son played football, never missed a game except one when our flight was delayed for four hours. <laughs> so, um, but it was, so that's when I realized this is my element, but I love it. Never, I'll, I'll do it till the end. That is, that's so wonderful. I think yeah. I met you during that time. I think you met, I met you before the world went crazy in 2008 and everything yeah, went to heck in a handbasket. I sitting when that happened. <laughs> yeah. So you've seen. Start changing. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. You've seen, you've seen all of that. So for the folks out there that, you know, don't know, you know, there's so many different facets of real estate. What does it, what are the, what are the programs? What are the things that a, a a mortgage broker handles? Um, Well, I guess everybody'd be a little bit different, but to start with it's pre-approvals for someone that's looking to buy a house. And that would be the first step is to get them pre-approved. And as we discussed earlier, um, getting pre-approved before, 
they look for a home is the best situation for them and as well as for all the other parties involved. Um, sometimes they may think they don't qualify for something and they may, or they might think they qualify for more and they don't. But this gives them an idea of what that would look like to them. What would their mortgage payment be? What would their rate be? Um, is their credit satisfactory? You know, and so it gives them all that information above. So when they do go in to make an offer, they can do it with confidence because they know they're qualified. Yeah. We prefer, um, and I know not everybody does, but we prefer to gather their documentation. If they don't want to, that's their choice. Um, but like I tell them, it takes a little time on your behalf. It takes time on our behalf and it may never close. You may never find a property or may decide not to do it, but it's worth it because at the end of the day, when you make an offer, you know you qualify. And it's a good representation for your agent who's making an offer on your behalf. And it also, to me, um, I know a lot of listing agents want that pre-approval. Yes. But it still surprises me how many don't. And um, I recently had a call from a borrower that had a pre-approval. And when they went to escrow, they weren't pre-approved. They never even ran their credit. Oh my gosh. They just listened, had a phone call, and they typed up a letter, said, you know, yeah, sounds basically, yeah, sounds good, like what you told me. And he didn't qualify. And so they oh. came to me, and but it was the same story. We couldn't, we couldn't do it. But um, we're still we're working with him now, and we're gonna get him to a place where he will qualify. He he will, he just has to do a few things. So those are things you don't want to see happen to them because it's for one, he went into it with good faith. He didn't realize that that pre-approval meant nothing. You know, he thought. Yeah, I have this piece of paper says I'm pre-approved. It must mean something. So um, I would prefer to put the time in and, and give them a real pre-approval. It goes through, we, credit has to be run. It gets ran through a decision system. Yeah, so, so, so tell me tell me the difference between, I mean, you don't have to go through every single thing, but right. the pre-approval you need, bump, bump, bump. And then when you get to the real deal, then you're going to need this whole litany of things. Correct. Um, well, you can do it one way or, or, or the other. Um, and there's, there are times we'll issue a pre-approval without all documentation. It might be a repeat client you've worked with a few times or mm. cut and dry. They've given you a W-2 and a pay stub, and that's really the main need of it. But if there's spottiness to it in any way, or if it's someone I don't know, um, we prefer to get the W-2 to current pay, whatever the decision agent calls for. Two months of bank statements, um, two pay stubs, a W-2. Um, different, different, different documents required for self-employed borrowers and you need tax sure. return, right? Absolutely. So it really depends on what's being requested or what's needed for that situation. But um, if they refuse to do it, we'll do our pre-clause to say based on the application, no, no supporting documentation has been received. We don't want to mislead anybody. And um, not like you can't issue one without it, but I don't feel that typing up a pre-approval and you haven't ran credit is not a responsible way to do to represent like, your borrower. It's like me renting out a property without running their credit would never not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Not going to happen. It doesn't benefit anybody because now you got this poor agents in escrow and someone else took it off off it, took it off the market to sell it and now it's no, it's not right. Going there. Yeah. So when you're so. pre-approving them, I know you have a whole variety of different loan options people can 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 utilize. Are you pre-approving them for a specific type of loan or are you pre-approving them just generally and then when you get further down you'll determine which loan option that best fits them typically it's a specific type of loan okay um but so there's there's going to be three categories there's a government loan fha um usda va there is um your conventional conforming anything below you know the the conforming loan limit uh and then there's jumbo Right. So if you're going to jumbo, then we're going to get two. Then there's no ifs or buts. It's two years tax returns, whether you're self-employed or not. Two years W-2s. But if you're conventional conforming, um, anything within that price range, you're going to be qualified for based on the information that we're going through. We'll ask them, what is the maximum purchase price you'll go for? That's not what we'll issue the pre-approval for. But if you're going to if you're looking at a property for seven hundred and that's the highest you'll go, that's what we want to pre-approve you for. That way, if you're going to offer 660, easy to do. It takes two seconds or two minutes. Um, and you want to do another one for 680. You know, it's easy to do that rather than having to rerun things every time you want to go up. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. You, you can't, so you don't pre-approve just for 
this is the max that you, based on your income that you, you don't, you actually have them pick that number. You want them to pick Yeah, it. because it's not always what they'll qualify is what are they comfortable paying? Right. Oh, and I agree. Right. I qualified yeah. for a lot more than I actually spent because exactly. I don't want to be. So if they just tell me, you know, 700 and I go, you, here you go. And then they see what that number is. Mm -hmm. So we, most of it's done remotely, right? You're, you're doing it on the phone, on email, um, you apply online, you can open, especially with all this stuff we're going through right now. But before I issue it, in most cases, uh, in the early process, I'll talk to them about that. Just say, what, what is the maximum payment you want? Especially first time home buyers. So I should clarify yes. that. Yeah. You know, I mean, people that have been around the, you know, done the rodeo, they, they, they're comfortable with what they're buying but they're still gonna see what those numbers look like. When we send out our pre-approval to them, not to an agent, I'm putting in there what the rate options are, what that P&I looks like, what the preliminary closing costs are. So there's no surprise. So they know what they're looking at. They know that this is the number I chose, but this is what it's gonna look like. Right, no, I think that's great. Definitely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So what if somebody comes to you and maybe they've got um, a positive, Maybe they've got great credit, but they don't have down payment money, or maybe they've got quite a bit of down payment money, like, you know, but they don't have such great credit. Are there mm -hmm. options for them? Right. So all those situations are different, but, um, so let's start with credit. Um, because there's the, there's three or four, there's loan to value. There's, um, the, for one, it's your product and program. So let's say someone has a down payment, they have the debt to income ratios are in line, but their credit is, is not to where it should be. And when I say not to where it should be, there's derogatory events, right? That's bankruptcy, foreclosure, deed in lieu. Those are different based on whether it's conventional conforming, whether it's a, a govy loan, or whether it's a jumbo. Jumbos, cut and dried, conforming is cut and dried. The govies are usually like half of the, half of the waiting time but there's no ifs or buts about it. So if it's if it says two years, it's two years. Yeah. Um, if it's not one of those derogatory events, but more it's a um, credit score, it depends on what, why. Is it because there's just a recent medical collection? Is it because you only have two, two trade lines and they're both maxed out? Credits became a very big piece of a decision. Um, and that's what happened to one of these clients that had got pre-approved without having their credit ran. And then when they did run it, it physically met the guidelines. I mean, in black and white, it says this is the lowest, you know, that you have to have this score. He met the DTI, he met the reserves, he met the credit score when to prove it. Oh. So there, because it goes by your overall profile and credit things are changing. They're looking at, now when you see a credit report, it'll show you what the two, last two years have looked like. Have, has the use of credit increased? Has their um, limits or their usage compared to limits increased? Are their mm -hmm. payments going up? What does the trend look like? So there's a lot of trending in, in that type of thing. For the most part, if, you're, if you meet those things, it's gonna go through. But there's that one, one off that it just didn't like it. But we have a system that will actually give us, okay, there's three scores and it'll say there's a, a opportunity to improve this score by 22 points, this score by 18, this score by 30. So we use that and that's how I'm helping this client is what they'll actually say, you pay this down to this, you pay this 18, whatever it may be, there could be many situations. Sure. And that get that score up. That's, that's but, great because yeah. I, yeah, if they pay off that medical collection, if they, if they have right. their actual amount 50% right. less than what they have credit on all those little tricks. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, we're going to take a little, I'm so sorry. No, no, I was um, just going to say, but I, my thing to them is never tell them to pay off anything without doing that homework first, because it, because it can actually change your outcome. It could actually be a negative. Interesting. When you have a delinquent account and then you do anything on it, it could make it, it could actually have a negative effect. But. Well, we're going to take a little, thank you so much. We're going to take a little break and we hope you all join us. Patty is going to talk yeah. to us um, a little bit more about other, other facets like um, refinancing, how COVID-19, uh, the pandemic has affected her business, if at all, and what she sees for the future. So stay tuned. Thanks. Wow. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of Crossroads in Learning on ThinkTech Hawaii. 
On Crossroads in Learning, our guest and I discuss all aspects of education here in Hawaii and throughout the country. You can join us for stimulating conversations to enrich, enliven, and educate. We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Condo Insider. I am here with Patty Kanuha, producing branch manager of VIP Mortgage, and she is going to talk in the second half about uh, refinancing. If this is a time you may want to consider refinancing, what that entails, and discuss a little bit about COVID-19 and how it's affected the mortgage business. So thank you. Welcome back, Patty. Uh -huh. So let's dive into refinancing. Is this the time we should consider refinancing with interest rates being lower? Um, yes, um, there has to be a benefit to doing a refinance. Even for a loan officer, we cannot do a refinance unless there is not what we call a benefit to borrower. And there are certain categories that meet that benefit. One of those is um, rate. The rate has to be lower. How the much lower? How much lower? The, the detail or the actual requirement is a quarter percent. Typically, oh. Yeah. But typically, honestly, that wouldn't be a benefit enough to most people, right? But the other, another option is cash out. They need cash out. They're going to pay off something. They're going to use it to, to put their child through college, or they're going to lower their debt or something like that. Um, um, and then... Purchasing is never a benefit. I mean, that's always a benefit. So that doesn't that doesn't make a difference. And if it's an investment property refinancing, there's really no rules on it. But um, as far as rates, they're extremely low. Um, I can't tell you a certain situation. I didn't price anything today, but I know like two weeks ago, we locked like three different loans at 2.99. Um, they might've had a half a point or something to that degree. And all, both, all three of those properties were actually owned less than three years, two years, less than two years. So that's how big of a difference it had made, you know, one and a half, one and a half percentage points to their um, interest rate. Um, but for a borrower, it's not always rate. It's, it's sometimes their situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe by refinancing, even though it might be adding more time on, it lowers their P&I payment, makes it more comfortable. Or, okay. or just by paying off certain pieces of debt, maybe they've taken on, you know, truck payment, especially during these times. Mm -hmm. You know, where all of a sudden your income's cut in half, and so it has to be. It has to make sense to the borrower, and has to. Um, the rate is always a you know focus point, and rightfully so. But also, you know, what is their bottom line is. So when we do our scenarios that we send to them, we'll act, we we put in you know like three or four different rate scenarios, but then we'll also put what is their monthly savings, you know, so they can. And then here's this rate with no points. Here's this rate with some points. How many months does it take to recoup that? So it doesn't make sense because sometimes just that 2.99 sounds great. Yeah. Well, uh, depending on credit and everything else, maybe that has a steeper cost that really doesn't make sense. Maybe three and a quarter costs you 50 bucks more a month, but it won't take you 60 months to recoup, right? So it's all about what is best for them. I have questions. I have questions. Yeah. Okay. So my first question is, do you have to own your home a certain period of time? I have two questions. That, that one is the first. Do you have do you have to own your home a certain period of time before you can refinance it? You should own it or have or even if you've owned it for three years, but if you recently did another loan, it should be six months. And the reason okay. why is that whoever did the original loan gets charged an early payoff if it gets refinanced and paid off within six months. So we're cognizant of that, even if it's not our loan. Mm -hmm. Even we're not refinancing our own because it's a steep, it could be, you know, it's, I think it's like 3% of the loan amount of the original loan amount. So it's a hefty fee. And 
because delivering an owner occupant loan, they don't want to have a delivered owner occupant loan more than more than it has to be like every six can't be more than once in six months. You have to wait six more months. So we just try to. It's very unusual to have one that young that really needs a refinance, but we yeah. can always get it started. We just can't record it until after the six months is up. Interesting. So then my second my second question is: Let's say it has. Let's say it's been a year or two. Do, when you're going through the refinancing process um, with VIP mortgage in your, in your situation, do you have to go completely requalify again? Let's say my original loan was with you. Am I going to have to requalify everything again? Just yes. like a regular loan? Okay. Yes. Yes, you do because it's a, it's a new day, right? Yes. So um, we don't know whether, what your income is. So all that stuff still has to document because it's still on the burden of the, real, of the um, loan officer or the lender to confirm that they have done their due diligence to make sure that they've done a loan that you can afford to pay back. Nobody wants to see somebody lose their home and nobody wants to be part of that. So it's our job to make sure that, as well as the fact that every file gets audited and that will yeah. be confirmed. But um, so the only thing that we do see happening is there are appraisal waivers happening fairly frequently, maybe 50% on refinances. So, um, that's sometimes helpful and save some time if you don't have to go through the appraisal process again. It's not a guarantee. It's really mm -hmm. behind the scenes, Fannie, Freddie, wherever that loan's gonna end up going, they have a system built in that can pull comps, et cetera. So when you run your decision, it'll tell you up front whether you need an appraisal or not. Very good. So let's talk a little bit about, about COVID-19 and what changes you've experienced, if any, since mm -hmm. since we all went into the lockdown and, and how is it affecting your operations? Um, so operation wise, um, there's not a whole bunch of change as far as we're not, I'm not meeting with people very frequently. Um, I do meet people to pick up documents if needed and just do it very, uh, of course, that's all changing as we speak, right? That you have more freedom to do that now, but um, the signing process definitely had a lot of changes. Um, if you work with T Title Guarantee, I actually liked their process. We got to where we'd send the docs out to the borrower the day before, so that they had that time to review review them. I'd be available to answer any phone calls. And then when they showed up for the signing, they had a metal table outside their window, oh. and the docs we passed to them, they'd have gloves and a mask. They'd be given their pen that they could keep, and um, they would just sign the signature pages there, and it took like 20 minutes. Have um, you seen a decline in purchases since? since we've I gone did this? originally. Um, so this all started in March, but I didn't really see any fall off to our business till probably about mid April mm -hmm. until about mid May. And then a few weeks back, it just kind of started booming again with purchases and only refinance. So there's been a difference though with, with COVID. There's so much opportunity for refinancing. However, if you're laid off, you can't take advantage of that yet now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of forbearance opportunities and that's wonderful as, as it should be. But if you're in forbearance, you can't refinance because you're yeah, not making and, a payment, right? And they're the ones that actually could use the refinancing. Right. So, wow, yeah. that's really tough. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, you know, forbearances can be three months. Um, it could be six months, depending on your situation, but you know, hopefully um, once I don't see rates changing too much in the future. So you hopefully, don't, not, I know that's probably something we'll discuss after, but I think that they'll still have that opportunity. Excellent. Well, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay. So as far as um, out there with real estate, just, and I don't know how involved, if you don't know the answer or you don't want to get into this, are you seeing, but you seem pretty familiar with, especially Kona, the Kona area, mm -hmm. are you seeing prices staying, you know, comparable to what they were prior to March or increasing or? Um, I don't can't speak exactly just from March, but I, I did um, check my own property and my sons and a nephew, all of who I have, can access. All of them have went up. I was, wow. and that was and I checked that about a couple of weeks ago before we even talked about having this call. So I've talked to a couple of agents that I've worked with. They said they have not seen a downward trend. Now, there's everybody has different markets. It doesn't mean it's not happening somewhere, but um, refinances, ones that needed appraisals came in at or above. 
And these are all properties that have, these last three I'm just speaking of have been all purchased within the last, within the last two years or less. So, hmm. um, so far, it, usually I would, I would think that we'd see some of this. But and so I'm, and so really, I, I can say honestly, I'm not qualified to speak about it directly because I don't. I only see what I see when I get an application, but I have not seen it directly. Interesting. Well, that's yeah. positive. You know, I've always had thoughts. Mm -hmm. I wonder if if folks are going to start thinking now, well, maybe we should move to Hawaii or get a place in Hawaii, right. just because we have had, you know, we've taken so many precautions and we have right. such a low count exactly. and and you know in at least in Kona, I'm not so sure about Honolulu where I am now, but when I lived in Kona for the last 20 years, I had time, I shouldn't say this, but I didn't even lock my door ever. I don't even know where the key was. I don't have, <laughs> so. I don't have a key either. Oh yeah, I don't have a key to my house. I don't, I don't know where it went a long time ago. Yeah, right? It's, it's just, it's so wonderful. It's so yeah. wonderful. Now I live in a secure building with video cameras and, and whatnot. Oh wow. <laughs> Different well, place. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I had you in mind. I just thought, you know, I, I respected you and appreciate so much what you do for the industry and all of your wisdom and experience. So thanks for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Greatly appreciate it. And I wish you all the best. Thank and you. you take care and I'll hopefully see you around town sometime when I'm popping I into Kona. So. Well, all thank right. you all for having me. And if, you know, if anybody needs follow up, just give me a call. You know where I'm at. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Aloha, Aloha, everyone. Thank Aloha. you for tuning in and we will see you next week. Take Mahalo. care. Aloha.